How many here find themselves right in the melody of that song, that you're in the waiting? You're in the waiting. And probably all of us could raise our hand for something, someone, some situation. I just want to tell you that song is just so scriptural. And it came to my mind Sunday when we sang it, and it came again today. And Psalm 105 Verse 17 through 20 in the Amplified, it says, He sent a man before them, even Joseph, who was sold as a servant. And his feet they hurt with fetters. He was 19. It says, Until his word came true, until the word of the Lord was tried and tested him. We don't need to try and test the word. We need to be tested in the word. Amen? So those of you who are in the waiting, I just repeat what that song said. Take courage, my heart. Be steadfast, my soul. And in Joseph's case, he had to take that soul and place it in iron so his soul couldn't guide him and lead him out of waiting for the promise to come. Right? That's what we need to do is put our mind, will, and emotions, that area that Satan uses to just begin to doubt and to get double-minded, and just place that in cages where it can't rule our life, and you wait until that triumph comes. Amen? Because even though you don't see it coming, maybe you don't see him moving, he's in the waiting just like he was with Joseph. That's why the story's there to encourage us that, yeah, it took a long time, but his promise came to pass, and they always do because every one of them is what, Lynn? Yes, yes and amen. amen. Yes and amen. All right, Jeanette, tell us what we're going to do in the next couple months. <laughs> amen. Yes and amen. I'm reminded, too, of how David had to encourage himself, and that's what that song reminded me of. And David had to go before the Lord because of all the things that were happening with his life. And he had to encourage himself. Amen? Well, welcome, everyone. Do we have uh, any new visitors this morning? Anybody new? Well, this is all family. And so we welcome all of us, all of us together. It's awesome to be together in the house of the Lord. Um, at Valentine's Day. We have a sweet treat for you as you're leaving today. So happy Valentine's Day. It's a love day. And um, every day is a love day, right? Because of our Lord and Savior. We also want to invite everyone to um, Sunday services. We're catching little foxes everywhere. This last one was busyness. And so if you find yourself in busyness, please go online and listen to it. And um, make sure you come out on Sunday because each one is amazing always. Our sight and sound trip. So if you made plans for Thursday, make different plans for Friday. <laughs> June 3rd is when we're really going. <laughs> that was just a test to see. If <laughs> so we found out that Miller's Restaurant is not available on Thursday. So we, we changed our tra trip to um, Friday on June 3rd. So um, we still need uh, $100 to, um, for registration, you know, so it'll save your seat. And um, if you use a credit card, that's fine, but the credit card will charge you, I think, 4%. So think about that. And um, we do need your deposit ASAP. Amen? And like we said, it's not until June. So if you can deposit, you know, have your deposit now and then save for the rest. It'll be 182 this time. All right, and now we'll draw your attention to the screens. Ladies, these seeds, I'm telling you, you can put that marigold in the ground and you can sit there and say, be a tomato, be a tomato. Oh, Lord, I pray it's a tomato. I just pray it's a tomato. I don't care how hard you pray. It's going to be a marigold. God doesn't live in buildings made by hands, not even in this beautiful sanctuary. When we leave, he leaves. And all of a sudden, I understood for the first time that I was, you are. Beth El, the house of God. And if you read Genesis 28, it should be a place of dreams and vision. What's your dream? What's your vision? He had a vision, the heavens open. What is the dream God put in your heart? 
Godfidence, a total reliance on God for everything, about everything, and in everything. It is an awareness that he is always working behind the scenes for our good, even when we are not aware. It is the pinnacle of knowing that when I can't, he can. So are you Godfident? The desire of every woman's heart should be a daily pursuit of Godfidence. And the place to begin this new mindset is at this year's Relentless Women's Conference Tour, beginning on March 12th at the Hilton Christiana, Delaware. Join us for this amazing time of moving into Godfidence and a new you in 2022, featuring Pastor Deborah Groler of Covenant Messiah Church and special guest Gwen Mollier, the founding pastor of Proclaiming His Word Ministries. We'll also be led in worship by Pastors Alex and Colleen McCormick. The deadline to register for this event is March 1st. Space is limited and registration is required. Visit RelentlessWomensConference.com for more information and let's be Godfident. Beautiful. Amen. And so you have your Relentless cards. All the information is on the back. Um, $25 for registration and you can go online and do that. It's very easy. Um, our deadline to register will be March 1st. So you see... We're in the middle of February, leaving and moving on, and so it'll come around quick. So please make sure. And um, we sent out 700 uh, email invites, so you need to rush <laughs> before the 700 all answer at once. Okay. Yeah, that's right, 700 ladies. That would be awesome, too. But we don't have room for 700, so we don't want you to miss out. This is how we keep saying that come, you know, register and give your, give your money, and we'll see you there. Yeah. And you can see it's going to be awesome. Um, the screens for donation is text to give, covenantmessiah.com slash donate. You can mail your offerings, and you can place your offerings in the back in the basket at the welcome table. And so let's uh, stand so we can pray. So Father God, we just want to bless you today. We thank you, Lord God, that throughout Hebrews, we know that Jesus Christ is our high priest, and we're seeing him more and more each day. And so Father God, as we study in Hebrews, and we declare that we understand that the high priest always went in with the offerings and presented them before God. And so our high priest, Jesus Christ, we ask that you take our offerings, our tithes, and present them before God in the most holy place. And that you bless us, Lord God. You increase us. We thank you, Father, for every person that constantly gives into this ministry. And we thank you that you bless them, prosper them in everything that they do. And that um, the seed will go forth and bring forth lives, Father. That's, what, that's our inheritance, so the uh, lives of people born again. And that's what our ministry wants to do. So we thank you for each and every one of them in Jesus' name. So before we greet, amen, before we greet, we're going to, um, I said on Sunday, all over Facebook there were these pictures and beautiful wishes to our pastor for her birthday. And so we want to just bless her today. Amen. So come forth and um, come forth. <laughs> Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday. Beautiful. Yeah. Did you, I don't know if you heard in that because she didn't have the mic oh, here, but sorry, yeah. did you?
Do you hear what she said? The sin of divination. A verse from every book of the Bible. I, I mean, and it's his fingers, which is what his word is. It's amazing. Happy birthday. And we also want to wish a happy birthday to our sister Lynn Brake. It's her birthday today. Amen. Happy birthday, Lynn. Blessings, Amen. blessings, blessings upon you. I've known Lynn for a very long time, and she's a blessing to me. Amen. Amen.
Okay. This was a long Greek. We lost our Facebook folks. They're probably like, well, they're going to be talking for a long time. Yeah, we got to get going here. Because I have a little bit long message anyway, so get your last stretch in because you might not be stretching for a while. So anyway, good morning, Tuesday beautiful people. That's exactly what you are. Good morning, Facebook. Thanks for your patience. He's in the waiting, so it's okay. I'm um, glad you're with us this morning. Let us know you're here, Facebook, by sending us a, a little like and a little heart. And also the comments right under, you'll see if you can put a little something, something there that lets us know you're watching and where you're watching from. And as usual, I so appreciate you sharing um, the Tuesday word and getting it out on your page. So happy yesterday, love day. Did y'all have a good day? Yeah? Yeah. Yeah. Some people were at Bible study on this. See, that's good. That's good. And, and we're very fruitful. Nina, she's no longer busy. You're going to have to listen to Sunday's message to understand that. But, in fact, I still have my busy and fruitful badges up here. But I'm retiring busy. Yeah, yeah. So, anyway, listen to those messages. But, anyway, hope your day yesterday was really, really good. And, um, as Jeanette said, we have just a little teeny treat for you just to let you know we love you too very much so enjoy that little treat hey did you know that hebrews is every woman's favorite book early in the morning you know why because hebrews right so yeah it's a favorite book early in the morning well today we're going to cross over and out of um, Hebrews chapter 6, and we're going to go ahead and move into chapter 7. And we're going to, again, we, we came across this mysterious character in chapter 5, and I didn't um, want to kind of go into depth there. I had mentioned to you that when we get to 7, we'll do a little bit more exhaustive and expository teaching, so we're going to do that today. Um, it's a very, very interesting character study of this mysterious person. Um, and I, I think so far, the entire book, what we've learned is that it was written by who I think it's Paul. Others have other opinions. They'll find out when they get to <laughs> heaven. They were wrong. Anyway, um, when with the entire book is written to encourage the early church, early believers, which, you know, we've, we've gone over and over that they were Jews. You know, there wasn't a Presbyterian in the bunch. They were Jews. The first church were Jewish believers, right? And so the purpose of the book, if you were to put it and capsulize it into one statement, it would be to encourage them to be steadfast, my soul, and have their heart, right, full of courage, because there was such a pull to go back to the sacrificial system, to go back to Judaism, if you will. And so it's written by a Jew to Jews, but we've been grafted in, and some of the same issues that took place then we get discouraged, and we sometimes revert back and slide back and drift and, and, and whatnot. So um, they also were, it's written to build up their faith and their maturity. We've read so many times, you know, about their maturity aspect that some of you should be teaching when you're still on the milk of the word. And the writer continually, and we're going to continue to see the continually, uses words like better and greater and more superior when he's speaking about Christ. Christ. Amen. He's greater than the prophets, we learn, greater than the angels, greater than Moses. Amen. So, and last week, last week we took a little detour and gleaned some real practical, practical insight, even though the context was exactly where we're going with this high priest understanding. But contextually, we stayed and yet we applied the fact that faith, hope, and patience, right? faith, hope, and patience, the importance of not just one of them. They all migrate together, and they work together to give us endurance, right? I hope you flagged that part of your study notes and whatnot because it is a very necessary part of our walk to have all three of those things attached together. 
because you can have faith that moves the mountains, but if it only lasts for a day, right, and you don't have the patience to keep that going and keep your faith, well, then it's only, you know, most of the time, God doesn't have these breakthroughs in a moment's notice, right? We have to have endurance. So again, we looked at hope being a blueprint, and it was, I, I really chewed on the message myself. I think the Lord really fed us well. But with that, at the bottom of your study guide last week, I had written there as the last thing before we departed, what did you take away from this lesson? What did you take away from this lesson? So I'm curious for someone to tell me what they did take away from last week. Beings, it was an important aspect of our spiritual walk and not just for the first century church that it's written to. Somebody, what, what, what stood out last week? Okay, all two of you have something to say. That's great. What stood out? What did you go home with? Yes, Faye. That's right. That's right. Oh. When, when God makes a promise, it always comes to pass. Amen. Yes. Thank you. yes. In his timing. In his timing. Someone else had their hand back there. I don't know if it was Jean or Sandy, maybe. Somebody, yes, Sandy. I think patience for me is, is big, very big. Yeah. Um, patience for all the things going on in my life and in my family and just standing on that just big time. Amen. One more. Let's come up here because we talked last week, so yeah, yes. Yes. I think what showed up for me is that, you know, you have that word patience, and in your own mind, you defined what is patience. Is it five days? Is it 10 days? Is it one year? Is it three months? Five so minutes. Five <laughs> minutes. So to really let the time go and to really look at patience in a different way. Amen. Amen. Because we saw the examples of how some of the patriarchs and whatnot had to wait right. more than five minutes, right? Right. But just as we read in Psalm 105, 20 today, until the word came to pass. God didn't change his mind on the word, right? But again, it's, it's what is happening to us while that's taking place. And he's after that just as much as he is bringing his truth and the integrity of his word to us, right? We'll take one more. Lena, yes. Say hope. You said hope is the yeah. blueprint yes. for faith. Yes. And that was like my word this yes. year because it's that positive um, expectation of God's good. Yeah. Yeah. Right. And to expect it. Expect it. Expect it. Amen. Well, good jotting down those things. So now we're going to see more closely. We've been kind of churning up to it, but, but today we're going to see the whole chapter actually deals with this more closely. Jesus greater than, better than, superiority over Israel's prestigious high priesthood. I mean, these were the guys. You were called to this place, and it was a very, very big role to play. And because his blood is the blood of God Almighty, right, all the barriers have been torn down. You know, the, that, that veil was a barrier. It was literally the picture of death, because if you went in wrong, or you didn't go in right, or you didn't go in at all, or all kinds of different aspects, it was a picture of death. And so the blood of God Almighty, Jesus Christ himself, tore down all of that as represented in that torn curtain. Amen. So with this in mind, let's look again at verses 19 and 20 of chapter 6, and then we're going to scoot right on in to chapter 7. So this hope, that blueprint, right, Lena? This hope we have is an anchor of our soul. Boy, that, you know, oh, I just feel so tempted to go there. You know, an anchor. Listen, I don't care if you're on a rowboat with an anchor or we were, we were on the biggest ship in November, Symphony of the Sea. It's the biggest ship in the world, the biggest one. And when they anchored that boat, that boat don't move. Let me tell you, you got a big anchor. Amen. You're, you're, the anchor of Jesus is bigger yeah. than any Royal Caribbean ship can ever come up with. And if we'll let that anchor anchor our soul, hope Hope is just going to have an expectation out of our patience in the faith of his word. Amen. Amen. Ooh, amen. Both sure and steadfast, which enters the presence behind the veil. Again, we're going right into Jewish kind of vernacular, aren't we? Where the forerunner 
has entered for us, even Jesus. So the writer tells us who this is. And then he goes into this, having become a high priest forever, a high priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. <clears throat> Jesus, having become a high priest forever, forever. See, the high priests in those days were very prestigious, but at some point they physically died. The, the role wasn't forever, right? Only Jesus has a role that is forever as the high priest. But then he goes into this according to Melchizedek. And again, all of chapter 7 is the backdrop for us to understand the high priest of Jesus. It's all a backdrop to that. So we need to, and I believe this is one of your blanks on your paper, we need to understand Melchizedek in order to understand Jesus, at least in this role as high priest. It's interesting because it's only, his name is only mentioned twice. Like how could something be so important to the understanding of such an important aspect and role of Christ, and yet it's only mentioned twice in the Old Covenant. And we know the Old Covenant always is the Old Covenant concealed, is the New Covenant revealed. But only two places here do we see that. Genesis 14 is one of them. Genesis 14, I believe that's one of your fill-in-the-blanks. Then a thousand years later, David... Genesis 14, then David, a thousand years later, will make mention of his name again, and that's in Psalm 110. And then a thousand years later, isn't that interesting? We have it again exposed, really, in the book of Hebrews, where it is mentioned eight times, his name is mentioned eight times between the chapters of five and seven. So five, six, and seven, we see his name mentioned eight times. He's mentioned in Genesis 14 because he has an encounter with Abraham. This is the very first time that we see this. So let's read it. Uh, before we do, though, this is after Abraham. I'll give you the little backdrop to this. This is after Abraham has successfully um, won a victory over four kings, four kings of the north, um, that have, they were in the process of taking Abraham's nephew, whose name is what? lot um and then he's visited by this mysterious person okay let's read it genesis 14 14 through 20 says now when abram heard that his brother was taken captive he armed the 380 trained servants who were born in his own house and went in to pursue as far as dan he divided his forces between them by night and his servants attacked them pursued them as far as damascus i don't think this is the right place is it yeah, okay, so here we go. So he brought back all the goods and also brought back his brother Lot. So I said nephew. It was just the wording that's used here in the name King James. It is his nephew. He brought back his brother because not only did they come and take Lot, they took some of the other people too. Uh, Lot and his goods as well as the women, and there you go, the other people. And the king of Sodom went out to meet him in the valley of Shavat, and the king's valley, after his return from the defeat of Chelamor and the kings who were with them. Then Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought out bread and wine. He was the priest of God Most High, and he blessed him, and he said, Blessed be Abraham of God Most High, possessor of heaven and earth, and blessed be God Most High, who has delivered your enemies into your hand, and he gave him a tithe of all, okay? So this is the first time we see this mention of this Melchizedek character. What I didn't give Marge to put on, but afterwards I read it, and I wanted you to see what else it said here. The very next verse, verse 21, it says, Now the king of Sodom said to Abram, Give me the persons, and you take the goods for yourself. But Abraham said to the king of Sodom, I have raised my hand to the Lord God most high, possessor of heaven and earth, that I will take nothing, not even a thread of your sandal strap. I will not take anything of yours, lest you should say, I made Abram rich. I just find that so interesting because that comes 
right after Abram tithes to Melchizedek. And we're going to talk a little bit about that later. You know, I, I, think there's, I think there's a little hidden nugget here that we need to expose. See, when we tithe, it breaks the power of money over our lives. Because the very next verse, here comes Satan. Well, I'll tell you what, if you know, let's wheel and deal on it. And because he was a tither, Abram wasn't tempted to fall into these economic financial mind games. He gave God the glory because he knew God was the one who did it, and he gave God the glory by worshiping him not just in word, not just in deed, but out of his pocketbook. I thought that was just so interesting to make note of. Now we move into a 1,000 years later to Psalm 110. Psalm 110 is a messianic passage. That's what we need to understand, and we need to keep that in mind as we read it. So verse 4 says, The Lord has sworn... And will not relent. You are a priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. So this is a messianic psalm. What do I mean by that? For those of you who are new to Bible study, it's pointing to Messiah. It's pointing to Christ coming. Way back, a thousand years before we're reading this in Hebrews, and a thousand years after this situation takes place in Genesis, David knew that. David knew this situation. That's why we need to share these Bible stories with our families and whatnot, because they stick, they take hold of our hearts, and then they become doctrine, they become behavior in our lives too. So David knew about this story, and he repeats, he repeats this order of Melchizedek. You are a priest forever. Didn't we just read that in Hebrews? That same exact wording we read. So those two things are the only two things. That's it. That's all she wrote. The only two things we read in the Old Covenant about my husband, Melchizedek. Now, back to Hebrews, the writer picks up on this guy that only two things are written about. So who is he? Who is he? If you're wondering, you are in a great cloud of wanderers right along beside them because there is so much information out there on this guy. He's a very mysterious, interesting character. And with lots of discussion usually comes lots of opinions and lots of places of thoughts and where truth is. So we come to, once again, one of these passages in Hebrews, don't we, where others have opinions, and there's several of them. I want to give you mine and the reason why, scripturally. Um, but understand that there's a great debate on Melchizedek and who he was and what his, his presence actually means, okay? So let's look at a couple of the opinions. I always like to, when we come to a debatable subject, not just give you my opinion and think that's, you know, I'd like you to see what other people are saying, and then you can kind of form your own thing before the Lord on what you think. So we're going to look at three main ones. If we were to put all these different debatable, discussable items into a funnel, we come down to, to three things. One of the things is started by a Rabbi Ismael, Rabbi Ismael, in 135 B.C. is when this was documented, okay? He believes that Melchizedek is Noah's son, Shem. Shem. And many believe that. Many Jews believe that. Why do you think many Jews would believe that? Well, because Shem, when you look at the table of nations, how, you know, when God um, ended the world through the flood, who came off of that boat were these three sons, right? Ham, Sham, and Bacon, right? Yes, those three, right? Ham, Japheth, and Shem. They came off of that boat. And, the, and a table of nations, all the nations that we know in every nationality come out of these three loins, okay? And out of Shem, out of Shem, I want to show you a picture. There's Shem at the top. You can see his line as you look straight on down. We came to some names we're going to be familiar with. Eber, we come to Nahor, Terah, and then look, there's Abraham. And out of Abraham, so, so what comes out of Shem? Tell me by looking at this. What nation comes out of Shem? Israel, Israel the Jews. So yes, of course, many Jews are going to want to think that this is from Shem. 
Okay, just kind of logically makes sense on why that would, would be the case. Now, it is true, this, this is something else that sometimes we forget because, you know, as time has gone by, people used to live 900 and some years, Methuselah, right? 967 years or something. But as time has gone by, people's lifespan has decreased. You know, I'm going for the 120, long and strong, right? Um, but... You know, today, statistically, mankind tells you maybe 85, you know, women tend to live a little longer than men. My point I'm making is sometimes we look at that and we don't realize how these contemporaries cross paths with one another because maybe it's several chapters later and we don't see that crossing of paths. But what I want you to know is that Shem was alive when Abraham was alive. So that's another reason why the Jews, many Jew, Jewish people, believe this is Shem because they were contemporaries within the same time. In fact, I did a little homework. Shem lived to be 600 years old. Abraham was 175. So they did live at that same time. And it, you, you might want to take a picture of this with your phone because I think this is really important to know where things began you know, certain nations, and we, we were grafted into the Shem line, right? So um, that's the first, the first thought, discussion, um, debatable item. Others believe, probably more believe this than anything, that he's a historical person in that he's a type of Christ, a type of Christ. You know, all through our studies together through the years, we have made mention of a, a title or a theme that says types and shadows. You know, like the, the Jewish festivals, the Lord's festivals. They were types and shadows of Christ. Types. They weren't the thing, but they were, you know, a dress rehearsal. They were a preview of what was the coming attractions were coming, right? So when I say type of Christ, I mean this person characterized some qualities of Christ, possibly some qualities of his ministry. A perfect example of that is Joshua. And there's many, but Joshua will pick. Joshua, his Hebrew name is Yuashua, okay? Yuashua, same name Jesus is, this, okay? His name is the same as Jesus, the same exact name. And he led the Jewish people into the promised land. Do you see the type that that is? Remember, I, I've taught this many, many times. It, it couldn't be Moses. Moses could never lead the Hebrew. And we get so upset. Why did God not let him do that? And my goodness, after those 300 million complaining Jews just because he struck a rock? Really, God? I mean, give the guy a break. It's bigger than that. It's bigger than that. Moses was a representative of the law. The law can never take us into the promised land. So it could never be Moses. God just happened to pick that rock thing, but it was never going to be Moses because the law can't take us into the promised land. But guess what? Joshua represents grace. Joshua was the one that took them into the promised land, right? Because that's how you get into the promised land is through grace. It's how you get to heaven is through grace, and it's also how you function in the promised land that God has for you here on earth. So Joshua is a type of Christ, okay? But he wasn't Christ. Make sure you get that. He was a type and a shadow, but he wasn't Christ. So then there's this third area, which I believe to be the correct one. And that is that Melchizedek is a Christophany, Christophany, or a theophany, it's also interchangeably called. That Melchizedek was a Christophany or theophily, theophany, meaning that Jesus Christ appeared in human form, pre-incarnate in his appearance to Abraham. Let, let, me, let me unpack that a little bit. Remember, Jesus is, was always in, in existence. He didn't just show up you know, in Bethlehem one day. He's always been in existence. He is, a, he is coexistent and co-equal with God. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. 
So before Jesus' name was Jesus, you know what I'm going to say, his name was Word, because he was there in the beginning, okay? He's coexistent and co-equal with God. He took on flesh, and he came into the world through the, the womb of Mary, but he always existed, okay? That's just how he entered the world. And there are times in the Old Covenant when he appears in human form, pre-incarnate is what that word would mean. And I believe this is one of those times, and we're going to go into why later. The big reason, I think, that, that just puts all the other debates in my mind at bay. This one, there's other things, but there's these other things we're going to talk about today can be somewhat you know, discussed. This one can't be discussed, so I started out fresh with this, and it's what Jesus said himself. What Jesus said himself about this situation in Genesis 14, John 8, 56, and 57. He's having this issue with the Pharisees and Sadducees. They don't believe who he is. So they say, your father Abraham, or Jesus says, your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day. And he saw it. And he saw it. And was glad. So the Jews said to him, you are not yet 50 years old and you have seen Abraham? Okay? Now that, that's a wow. I want you to see it in the Amplified. Your forefather Abraham was extremely happy at the hope and prospect of seeing my day. The day that we're, that, that we're talking about in John 8. My incarnation. There it is. And he did see it. And he was delighted. Then the Jews said to him, you are not 50 years old and you have seen Abraham. I mean, before Abraham was born, I am. Let's look at verse 58, just to, just to, and this is what he said in response to them. Jesus said to them, most surely I say to you, before Abraham was, I am. I bet that put the little discussion to, darn, they went away, kicked in the dirt and thinking, we got to get them some other way, right? I mean, before Abraham was, I am. I am what? The self-existent one. I am always, has been, and always will be. I am. And what got me is where it said, Abraham saw my day. Well, how could he see the day? Because the gospel wasn't preached to him. He saw the day because Melchizedek was him. When he saw Melchizedek, he saw Jesus Christ. He saw the day, right? I think Jesus in John 8 was referring to Genesis 14 when he said that. No other debatable possibilities, the Shem and the type, can, can come against this. This is Jesus' own words that said this, okay? Now let's look at the characteristics because now I think we're just going to continue to embellish why I believe this is a pre-incarnate um, Jesus himself as a Christophany, okay? Characteristics. Let's read. Um, it's in the first four verses of this chapter, so let's just read through them together. For this Melchizedek, king of Salem, priest of the Most High God, who met Abraham, so there it is. He met Abraham, returning from the slaughter of the kings, and he blessed him, to whom also Abraham gave a tenth part of all, first being translated king of righteousness, and then also king of Salem, meaning king of peace, without father, without mother, without genealogy, having neither beginning days nor end of life, but made like the son of God. Don't let that trip you up. We're going to go there. Remains a priest continually. So he, how could he be a human being? He, he had a continual priesthood. There was no end to it, right? Now consider how great this man was to whom even the patriarch Abraham gave a tenth of the spoils to. His name, Melchizedek, comes from two Hebrew words, Melech and Zedek. Melech and Zedek. Melech means king. Zedek means righteousness. King of righteousness. Sounds like Jesus to me. Not just that, but do you know, I think it's Jeremiah. It's just coming to me now. I didn't think of this till now. 
Jeremiah, when the millennial reign comes and we're reigning and Jesus has his kingdom on earth and that millennial thousand year reign comes, it says in that book, we're going to call him Jehovah Sikkanu. We're going to call him Jehovah Sikkanu. What does Sikkanu mean? Righteousness. So we're going to call him King of Righteousness. And here we read, that's exactly one of his names that he's called, okay? Also, he comes from, he's a king of Salem, where we were get the word Jerusalem from. Where did Jesus come from? Jerusalem. Came from eternity, we know that, but he came out of, out of, and it says the word will go forth out of Jerusalem, doesn't it? Yeah. The two positions he's got, he's a king of Salem, Again, comes from the word shalom, by the way. So he's not just the king of Salem, he's the king of peace. Because shalom means peace. Who else is the king of peace? Yeah, he's the prince of peace, right? But he also is a priest. Let's go back and look at that in those verses. He's not only a king, but he's also a priest, right? Listen, there is nowhere in Scripture except here, no one else. There's no one else in scripture that serves the dual role of king and priest. You can be a prophet and a priest, you, you can be, you, but you can't be a king and you can't be a priest at the same time. No earthly person ever remained doing that. I can't say they didn't try, but no one was allowed to continue with that. There was two, one of them, tried to serve that dual role of king and priest, and he actually got leprosy as a result of that. Who, who remembers? Because I taught this not too long ago on Sunday, I think. Who, who remembers who that might be? The, the king that tried to be a priest. I'll give you a hint. In the days of king, I saw the Lord seated on a throne. And it's true. Uzziah, yes, King Uzziah. That's exactly what happened. I think it's in Chronicles that he tried to step into the role of priest and he got leprosy as a result of that because it wasn't allowed. Then there's one even more familiar, King Saul. He had the kingdom literally stripped away from him because while he was Israel's first king, he tried to step in the role and his impatience because things weren't moving as fast as he wanted them to. Not only did he consult with a medium, but on top of that, he tried to step into the role of a priest, and the literal kingdom of his kingship was really uh, stripped away from him. It's clear in the Old Covenant. It's clear, it's clear. If you're a king, you cannot be a priest. And if you're a priest, you can't be a king. Jesus Christ is the only one that is king and priest, and by the way, he's prophet also. He filled every single role. Why? Because he was the fulfillment of all the old covenant. Anybody that stood in for the word of God or prophesied or was ruler, of course, he's going to be the fulfillment of. Amen? What are some other characteristics? Well, it says here in verses 1 through 4, he has no genealogy. Okay, we don't know his mother, we don't know his father. And some who want to say he's a type or whatever will say, well, the, the, you know, maybe we just didn't know. That doesn't mean anything. Well, when we're looking for him to be a Christophany, we see every one of these fall into place, especially John 8, when Jesus himself said what he said about, about Melchizedek and that, that it is him. So no beginning, no end. In fact, Revelation 1.8 says this, Jesus saying to John, I am the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, who is and who was and who is to come. I am the Almighty. He has no beginning and no end. He has no genealogy. Some of you who think Mary's his mother, Mary was just a vessel used to bring the incarnate pre, you know, the pre-incarnate from the old covenant, Christ into the world. Mary is not God's mother. God doesn't have a mother. Now, if you come from a Roman Catholic background, you've been taught that. She, Mary is a very special woman, a very woman that needs to be honored, but she doesn't have a, he doesn't have a mother. You know, I've heard, I've, I've heard Roman Catholics say to me, well, you know, we pray to Mary because, you know, mothers can do things with sons that, you know, that nobody else can do. No. No, 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 no. Not, not, that's not a good story. Um, in fact, Jesus himself said, who is my mother? Right? When they said, oh, Jesus, your mother and brothers are outside. You know, they're waiting to talk to you. And what do you say? 
who are my mothers and my bro- who are my mother and my brothers those that 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 take the word of god and obey it that's who my family is right and he gave john he gave at the cross john here's your mother he didn't say here's my mother amen it's a little sidetrack there anyway so where are we at no beginning and no end whatsoever verse 3 also says he's like the son of god disputers will say see there it is that word like like the son of god well in daniel chapter 3 we have again that everybody agrees on a pre-carnate christophany theophany the appearance of christ it's when daniel is thrown with shadrach meshach and i don't want to go back um into the fiery furnace and look at what Daniel 3.25 says. Look, he answered, I see four men loose walking in the midst of the fire and they are not hurt and the form of the fourth is like the son of God. So that don't let that word like throw you off because everybody agrees. This fourth person was Christ in the middle of them. When this was all happening. Same phrase, but it was Jesus as the fourth man in that fiery furnace, amen? Another point in verse three, Hebrews chapter 7 says he remains a priest forever. In other words, he has an eternal priesthood. Nobody has an eternal priesthood except Jesus Christ. All other priests died at some point. Nobody was eternal. And it's saying here in Hebrews, he has an eternal. Now remember, this is being preached to Jews, okay, who this is their rock star. I mean, it's the, these guys are the ones that went in and did it right, and they all waited for the bells to ring because, you know, if they didn't do it right, you know, the whole sins of the nation were on the borderline here. So the, all this proof, which is, all this proof is, is for the writer, who I believe is Paul, is trying to point out, no, no this, this doesn't exist anymore because Jesus, he is all of that. All that you were preparing for is here now. All that you prepared for is here and now. Then in verse 2 and 4, it says Abraham gave tithes, tithes to Melchizedek, right? Genesis 14 tells us Abraham tithed to him. We just read it. I want to let you know that in Genesis 14, where Abraham tithes to Melchizedek, it's the first time we see the word tithe. The first word we see, tithing. And tithing, for those of you who maybe don't know, if you're listening on one of our media sources, is the giving of a tenth of your income, okay? And it's done here in Genesis before the law. It's before the law. There was no law in Genesis. The law don't come till Charles Heston comes on the scene, right? Abraham didn't see the movie. You know, this is before the law, okay? 500 years, as a matter of fact, before the law. So when people say tithing is of the law and God did away with it, no, tithing took place first mentioned 500 years before the law was ever brought down. He tithed till Melchizedek. And since we give on, tithing always means worship. It's worship. So you could just say that, Abraham worshipped before it was required. Abraham worshipped before it was ever required. He tithed to Melchizedek. And since we give into the Lord, we don't give into people, right? We, we, when we give our, our offerings and our tithes, we're giving unto the Lord. I believe, again, this proves that Melchizedek is the pre-incarnate Christ, not Shem, and not a type. Why in the world would he tithe to Shem? And I've read some just different, you know, debates about this. Well, you know, Shem was older than him and honored him. No, this is an offering, a sacrifice that was given. It, it doesn't really add up to make any sense whatsoever. And lastly, if that's not enough, Genesis 14 also tells us that Melchizedek gave bread and wine to Abraham. Bread and wine he gave to Abraham. Sounds like communion to me. And he blessed him. 
He blessed them. Listen, whenever you're blessed or whenever you're a blessing, the greater goes to the lesser. It doesn't mean we're a lesser person or a greater person, but affluently speaking. And for Melchizedek to bless him, there's a greater place here proven by him bringing refreshment of wine and, and bread, proven by the tithe that was given, proven by just the, the characteristics that we read in Hebrews about who he was. Amen? So let's continue reading verses 5 through 10. Actually, I, I know I'm not going to have time to finish this whole chapter, positively not. So what we're going to do is I'm going to take us through 10, and then next week we're going to pick up but go over your notes before we get together next week so I don't have to spend a lot of time reviewing what we went over because the rest of the chapter deals with these foundations I just went over with today. Understanding Melchizedek because chapter 7 is the backdrop of Melchizedek to get a further, richer, deeper understanding of who Christ is by understanding this guy. Okay, so let's read verses 5 through 10. And indeed, those who are the sons of Levi... Now, this, for those of you who are new to Bible study, he's going to start taking us back to the law now. Because in the law, those that were of the tribe of Levi were the priesthood. Okay? And he starts mentioning this. Indeed, those who are of the sons of Levi who receive the priesthood have a commandment to receive tithes from the people according to the law. That is, from their brethren, though they have come from the loins of Abraham. But he whose genealogy is not derived from them received tithes from Abraham and blessed him who had the promises. Let me stop here before we go to seven. Jesus is not from the tribe of Levi. Who's, where is he from? Judah. Judah. So this, this writer, Paul, I believe, is trying to explain that the, the Jews would be asking this. See, us Gentiles, we might not think to come up with that, but they're sure going to come up with it. Because they're rock star priests are from the tribe of Levi. Who's this, you know, guy walking around with this lion label on? Right? Now, beyond all contradiction, the lesser is blessed by the better. I just mentioned that. Here, mortal men receive tithes, but there he receives them, of whom it is witness that he lives. Even Levi who received tithes, paid tithes through Abraham, so to speak. For he was still in the loins of his father when Melchizedek met him. Let, let me try to unpack that a little bit. So what's he saying? He's saying this. See, the Jews had to learn, and they still do, that the customs that they had learned back then in that thousands of years of old covenant were all pointing to Jesus. They, they had to learn that. So that once Jesus came, he fulfilled all that. Doesn't mean we never read the Old Testament. There's beautiful riches out of the, the Old Testament. In fact, if Jesus fulfilled it, then it's, a, then it's alive. Because if it wasn't, he wouldn't have to fulfill it, right? The big linchpin, though, was, was you can't get to God without going through a priest. That was the big linchpin for the Jews in this day and in that day also. So the writer is saying, you have a greater priest. Don't worry about that. You have a greater priest from a greater priestly order. See, that, that, there, there's the loophole that God brings into this, to this scenario. You have a greater priest from a greater priestly order, Melchizedek. Why? Because Christ was Melchizedek. See how that lines up? Versus the priesthood from the law, which were Levites. And because Melchizedek was in Genesis before Exodus came, Genesis does come before Exodus, doesn't it? So that means that priesthood was established before the natural priesthood of the Levites was established, which is why it's a better priesthood. And it's the one Jesus came from. So before Jesus went and said, I am the great priest, he proved it in Genesis when he appeared himself to Abraham. And John 8 says, and he saw me and he was glad for this day. Oh, I got chills. Mm. 
Levi will be the great grandson of Abraham. And as you know, the priesthood was formed out of Levi. And that's who the Jews go to to connect with God. Do you see how all this had to be? What? This was like heavy revy for them. Heavy revelation. The writer is saying that there is another priesthood. That This is the point of chapter 7. There's another priesthood that transcends the Levitical priesthood. It transcends the Levitical priesthood. And it's Melchizedek, which is why Jesus had to be Melchizedek. Not a type, not some other thing. They all want him to be Shem because Shem is where the Jewish nation was birthed. But do you see why it had to be Christ himself? Had to be him. So because Melchizedek, Christ himself, is a higher priestly order, he predates, precedes, and transcends the Levitical order. So what's he saying? We have, we have more scripture to go, but I know, you know, in order to just go through this chapter, this seemed like a good place to stop because our time's up, but forget the earthly priesthood. It's been fulfilled by your, 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 your high priest, great high priest, whose name is Jesus Christ. And we're going to read later on, later on in a few chapters from now, right, that no more will there need to be even sacrifices. He not only came as the high priest, he brought his own sacrifice. It was him. This is like amazing stuff, isn't it? I mean, this is so good, I think I'm going to get saved again. <laughs> Seriously. That is just amazing, just absolutely amazing. So read through the rest of the chapter. You got about maybe 20 verses to look at. Next week, I, I don't really ever ask you to do this, but next week, do your best to have read over this a few times um, and your notes so that we can just scoot right into it because we're going to go deeper into this convincing of these, this early church about him as the priesthood. And he's going to make some Jewish stuff that we need to understand so that we can come to a deeper understanding of who he is also. Amen. Would you stand with me? Amazing. Just absolutely beautiful and amazing stuff. Absolutely. It is. It is, Sandy. It's amazing. I, I thought about, you know, like reading... Let's see in how many verses it has. I think it's 20. Yeah, we're going to see in here. He's going to quote Psalm 110 that we talked about. We're seeing um, this greatness of this high priest. Um, but he, because his because he continues forever, has an unchangeable priesthood. Therefore, he is able to save to the uttermost those who come to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. For such a high priest was fitting for us, who was holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners, and has become higher than the heavens, who does not need daily as those high priests did offer sacrifices, first for his own sins and then for the people's, for this he did once and for all when he offered up himself. For the law appoints as high priests men who have weakness, but the word of the oath which came after the law appoints the son who has been perfected forever. Good stuff. Just good stuff. Lord, we just thank you for, we thank you for Jesus. Father, we thank you for Jesus. Lord, we thank you that you, you literally on the cross, when he was, was moving with his own sacrifice, not for his sin, he didn't have any, for our sins. This high priest from the past had to, had to cleanse himself first before he could even step in for the people, but not this great high priest. This great high priest had no sin. He t because of that, he was able to be an eternal high priest taking on in a perfect, holy, 
being everything wrong in every single one of us. And now he is forever the great high priest and no longer is there a need for anything else but just to worship you, Jesus. Father, I am just smitten to even remember as we're in prayer right now that you even had to turn your face away from from your co-existent, co-equal because you can't look on anything unholy. You couldn't look at any, you can't look upon sin. And that this great high priest of ours would, would then take this offering of his own blood and place it on heaven's mercy seat. Not the mercy seat in Jerusalem, but the one in heaven. And you were finally Father, satisfied once and for all. And because you were satisfied, I thank you that we can be satisfied with that work. And I pray for each one of my sisters in this room, Lord, that are going through that weight, that are just in that patience time. Lord, you have took everything, everything that would ever concern us and are perfecting it for our good and for your glory. And we just give you thanks in this room. We just give you praise in this room for what you did, Jesus. What you did for us. I'm so thankful to study this book and go deep and wide into the love. The love that you personified by going to that cross, paying that price shedding your blood, not just that, the mockery you took, the criticism you took. I thank you that you are not the great I used to be. I thank you you're not even the great I'm going to be, and there are some going to be's we're going to see. You are the great I am. I am a present help in your time of need. I am your righteousness. I am your peace. I am your healer. I am your deliverer. I am your bread of life. I am the beginning and the end and everything in between. So, Lord, we just put our trust in you fresh and new this morning. We just roll over every care and concern. We just cast it upon you. And we receive a greater measure of your comfort, a greater measure of your peace, a greater measure of all that you are, Lord. Like, just grow us today in this room. Just grow us in our spirits that we are bursting and our salvation is working its way out. That when we go out of here, that the salvation that we learned in a greater depth about today will work its way out of us and touch somebody today. Lord, help us not waste this teaching. Help us download this on somebody today. And when necessary, use words. And we just adore you, Jesus. We worship you. We bow down before you. There is none like you. None like you. And we do pray. We do pray. You would come. Come, Lord Jesus. And we pray it's today. And if you should tarry and we get back together next week, I pray we would come fully equipped to hear what you have to say, Holy Spirit, next week on this matter. And it's in Jesus' precious name that we ask all this. And the church said, amen. If you're here today and you don't know Jesus, man, this is the greatest day you could ever enter into a relationship with him. So come up front and see us. Once we're dismissed, I would love to give you the, the words and the prayer and the Bible and mark the date down and work together with you walking with Jesus. Amen. Have a great week and worship your high priest this week like never before. Amen. Amen.